Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, everybody. Uh, you'll have to excuse me, Matt. I am uh, going to be enjoying a, a cup of my super-duper special hot chocolate while we talk. Nice. That's a very northern DMZ thing for you to do. I don't, very I don't, rustic. I don't, and I, I, I feel like um, I, 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 this is not a hard thing to do, proper hot chocolate. Um, and I feel like people, I don't know why you would buy an instant mix. Uh, why would you want to make uh, something with water for hot chocolate? That just makes no sense to me whatsoever. All this is, by the way, if people can see, uh, you take an equivalent amount of heavy cream and equivalent amount of chocolate, the ch uh, chocolate chips or chocolate you cut up or what have you. You boil the cream. As soon as it reaches the boiling point, you dump in the chocolate, stir it till it melts. And you keep that. You can keep that in the fridge. And like, oh, I didn't so you, know that. So you can make a whole vat of it, keep it in the fridge. And then when you want to have an actual cup of hot chocolate, you take an equivalent amount of your of your chocolate. Essentially, it's like a chocolate fudge. Do you equivalent amount of that with whole milk and warm that together. And you will get the chocolatiest, creamiest hot chocolate mm -hmm. imaginable. I like it, Bill. I think I think you're right. Uh, these are the traditional values that we grew up with. I like it, and well, I would. Argue, well, I grew up, I grew up with Smith, Swiss, Swiss Miss. So exactly, that's we, we all kind of did, and 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 uh, but we're getting back to those values. Um, not only do I think that you're right, I would even argue healthier. You know. And part of it is, I think, when we eat, when we eat these these things that are like diet this or diet mm -hmm. that, we're not you know satiating our, our our desire for cream and fat and and real chocolate. And so, I would say that uh, you know I don't like to throw the word hero around <laughs> uh, describing us, but once again. While you're calling me a hero, I'm trying to get this marshmallow from the bottom of my cup. <laughs> uh, why we do that? Oh. There we go. Um, we're taping on Thursday. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot going on in the Mueller investigation, but uh, I, that's a lot of that's in flux. I, I, I think it's it, whether it's today or tomorrow, the Mueller team is going to go to the judge and we can say, here's all the ways that Paul Manafort lied to us. Uh uh, we don't know where are these extra investigations that Michael Flynn is participating in. There's all sorts of things swirling out there. I am sure by the time this episode is uploaded to the interwebs, 10 other things are going to happen in this investigation that we can't even anticipate. So I think we're probably safe not getting into it. <laughs> uh, I will uh, I will vote to skip it. <laughs> uh, we are taping the day after the George H.W. Bush funeral. Uh, which, at, at least on the left, I, I mean, I don't know how folks feel on the right. You know, H.W. Bush wasn't that beloved on the right in his day. Uh, but the, a good number of folks on the left really look at him as the uh, uh, sort of the pinnacle of nasty race-baiting campaigning with Willie Horton and Lee Atwater, uh, the revolving door ad in Dukakis, uh a cheap shot with the tank right at all that kind of thing, um, and and not to mention stuff like nominating Clarence Thomas, for example. Uh, and I think people are also mad at him over his prosecution of the drug war, holding up a bag of drugs in the Oval Office and um, sending in troops into Panama. So when we're having our traditional warm remembrances of a of a fallen president. Uh, and it, you know, I say my, for myself, I had a tweet that highlighted his more progressive domestic policy achievements. He signed the Americans with Disabilities Act. He enacted the Clean Air Act in 1990, which is the legal basis for the government. Now, you're, you're adding to the bad things. You're continuing <laughs> down that path with the bad things. <laughs> these, right? these, are the good things the Matt. these are the good things, Matt. These are the good things. There's a government's legally obligated to do something about climate change, about carbon pollution, because of the 1990 Clean Air Act, even though conservatives think that was a bad court ruling. That's what the court ruled, that that act 
dictates that. Uh, Bush also, uh, I mean, conservatives pilloried him for the tax increase, but he was the last Republican president to cut the deficit. Uh, this is the last president to enact a bipartisan gas tax increase, which you know even Donald Trump says he wants, but doesn't do the legwork to actually uh, make it happen. Uh, and that's not just an environmental thing. That's about building roads, building bridges. That's where that money goes. That's infrastructure money. Um, it's 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 based on a. Cons- I mean, you know, Bush actually insisted on having a gas tax increase be part of that package because this. So it wasn't a tax on the wealthy the way Democrats wanted. It was you use the roads. You pay for the upkeep. So that's sort of a conservative personal responsibility principle. Uh, and so all these. Well, and originally, and originally, there wasn't going to be any income tax hike. Uh, right. But then this is the this, this Steve Kornacki book, <laughs> Red in the Blue, mm-hmm. when then, but then Republicans wouldn't support Bush's hiking of like the gas tax and some other, I think it was like alcohol or something. So then he had to get more Democrat votes in order to pass. So the original breaking of the read my lips, no new tax pledge would have been, if, according to Kornacki, mm-hmm. would, would not have been an income tax. Right, right. Uh, so uh, but these are things which I would say he's generally lauded for today. Uh, I mean, American Disabilities Act just by itself, I mean, that's a truly transformational bill, whether you... Whether you're a libertarian who hates it or not, like you cannot deny it has had an enormous impact on American society and the integration of people with disabilities into American society. Uh, you still see folks on the left um, trying, not, not everybody, of course, but some trying to push back on, hey, don't focus on that stuff. Uh, this doesn't make him a wonderful person. Uh, you still have to look at all the, the, the racial stuff. And, you know, he signed the Civil Rights Act, but he called it a quota bill at first. And he was pushed into it. Um, uh, and and even I had a back and forth with someone on Twitter saying I should give him credit for the Americans with Disabilities Act because that was a bipartisan bill. Anyone would have signed that. Dukakis would have signed that. What, is, what does he deserve credit? Uh, and you know, Dukakis probably would if he was sitting in the chair. In fact, they both endorsed it in the 88 campaign. Uh, but it was a big deal that Bush endorsed it, and Dukakis had other things that he endorsed that Bush didn't that are, were more ambitious. Uh, but you don't know if Dukakis would have been able, if he would have focused on that bill and rallied that bipartisan support, or would he focus on other elements of his package that wouldn't have gotten bipartisan support? Uh, or he would have focused on other issues entirely, because it's a big job and you can't focus on everything. Uh, so, you know, Bush's role in that early is relevant to its uh, passage, and he does deserve credit for that. Uh, so I can certainly see in when we judge the man in the eyes of history, you take all the good and all the bad, and you try to square it all. Uh, but in the immediate passing of someone's death, it's not uh, outrageous to say, before we, 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 we bury this person, Let's talk about the good parts while his family is grieving, and we could save the more clinical analysis for for later. Yeah, no, I think that's right, especially in the case of an American president. I think we probably need, rather than looking for things to complain about or failings, or probably at this point in our history, it's nice to celebrate something. And so I'm in favor of that. I know there are, there are even libertarians who, who this guy isn't a king. Why are we lionizing? The, you know, but I, look, we need we need some things to believe in. We need some uh, a shared history. And, and so I'm, I'm on the side of uh, of celebrating the man and his time. And I would just say, I mean, for me, you know, you mentioned some good things and some bad things. And I think, look, every president Every president, uh, you could, you could, even the great Ronald Reagan. There are people who who will nitpick here and there, Iran Contra or something. Um, none of us are are perfect, and there is no perfect president. But I would say, in the case of George H. W. Bush, the winding down of the Cold War and managing that as as a, as, as as fraught with the, we do not realize how fraught with danger that time was. And how Bush was able to manage that in a relatively peaceful way is a huge accomplishment. And I think that alone is 
a legacy that would outweigh any of the negatives. Uh, when I was in college, one of my first acts of protest was the first Gulf War. Uh, and I don't, uh, I don't regret that protest. To be honest with you, I, th- I, I do think, and I know there's a bit of quibbling about this historically. I do think the Bush administration made a mistake when his ambassador went to Saddam Hussein and said, "Your border dispute is not our concern." Uh, that might have been, ten- they might not have been intentional to give him a green light to invade Kuwait, but I don't think it helped. Uh, and you know, the, some, the, that could have been anticipated a whole lot better. Uh, I can still, uh, in the in hindsight, say even if I disagreed with how we got there, uh, the fact that he went to the UN first and respected international institutions, I think, is enormously important. Uh, and uh, the fact that he had a sense of limited mission. We're here to get him back over the border. We're not here for regime change. Uh, I think there's some fair criticism of you. Did he send some mixed signals to the Kurds they didn't follow suit on? Yeah, I think there's room for some critique there. Um, but the basic idea of we have a limited mission, we achieve that mission, and we deal with these other problems later, not through invasion, uh, that's also a sense of principle that is worthy of respect. Um, uh, so I, I do think he was a uh, he, he was thoughtful on the world stage, even if you might disagree with one aspect or another. Uh, he was not someone who was uh, functioning in a in a knee jerk or amateurish manner, uh, uh, and that deserves to be respected in the eyes of history. But your point about how we sort of needed this moment, we need this sort of national unity moment. I think there's a big part of that that antagonizes the left right now, again, part of it. Yeah. There is a rejection of the establishment narrative that lauds bipartisanship, uh, and they don't like the fact that it's the Washington establishment that's driving the narrative that you know Bush is a symbol of the old ways that we should be going back to. Uh, these are folks. Pe- left- these people who have the John Meacham voodoo dolls, and they're right, just right. poking the <laughs> right. Uh, you know, they 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 want Democrats to be stealing for a fight. Uh, I, I just give you a, a concrete example here. And look, I I have written in the past. So I would still say the sort of alter bipartisanship is way overdone. You know, a bill does not magically become good because there are bipartisan co-sponsors. The, the substance of the bill could be bad or ineffectual. And often isn't effectual because whether you're agreeing upon it so small that it doesn't make the bipartisanship worth it. Uh, but you could take that critique too far and say, uh, if there is a Republican on the bill, I'm going to oppose it. Regardless of what the yeah. substance of the bill is. And so I had a piece. We talked about the climate issue last week. Uh, I wrote a piece about this for Real Clear Politics about how uh, this, there's such a push on the left now for a Green New Deal, quote unquote, that Alexandria Ocasio Cortez is championing, uh, which is a way to spend money, spend government money on a very rapid uh, zeroing out of fossil fuels. Uh, and not that I disagree with that on the substance, but that is a very tall order uh, to expect to get through Congress, let alone actually do in practice to actually uh, make the transition occur in that brief uh, a window. Uh, now, there is a bill that came out also the other day, which is a carbon tax bill. I mean, a carbon tax saying that you know, when in 2016, Bernie would attack Hillary saying, I'm the only one for a carbon tax. This proves how serious I am about, about the climate. I'm going to tax carbon pollution. Well, there's a bill now that will do that, and it's bipartisan. It's got it, it's got three Democrats and three Republicans in the House. That's not a lot of people, of course. I'm not saying it's going to pass the Senate. I'm not saying Trump would sign it. But uh, you we're thinking about what's going to happen after Trump, what could possibly get the 60 votes and be signed by a president. A bill that has three Republican sponsors has got a leg up on one that has zero. Uh, so, at minimum, I'm not saying don't have the debate, I'm, but don't don't dismiss the carbon tax bill out of hand just because 
Republicans are on it. But I literally have people in my Twitter feed saying that I should do just that. Because a Republican is on the bill, that means it is bad. And I do not care what the substance of the bill is. They are not trustworthy. They're they're stringing you along. They'll abandon you when you need them. So don't even try. It will hurt you if you try. Yeah. Uh, and so therefore, I, you, you're seeing that chafing at... Uh, the lionization of Bush as being a symbol of bipartisanship, you're seeing some of the left actively push back on that. Right. Well, look, I think, you know, ironically, the the hatred of bipartisanship is a bipartisan phenomenon. <laughs> and Republicans went through this whole time where it was about, you know, but he fights. And I think that this is a, a, a bipartisan phenomenon where we we don't care about civility or institutions or norms i think that the the excitement on the right and on the left is to is to fight and to eschew the establishment and their their protocol and their their prudence and their um you know anything mainstream is lame stream now and and i think it's infecting the left now as well as someone who is an institutionalist <laughs> who you know believes in civility and norms and institutions i think that this is something that this life and uh, legacy is worth celebrating and that that's positive but i think there are people on both sides who uh think George Bush and his, you know, global world order and, you know, this aggression will not stand, man, all that stuff there, you know. Um, so, look, I'm on the side that says let's have something every once in a while that we can agree on and believe in and, and then we can go back to fighting each other, you know, and tomorrow. Uh, look, I, I in no way rationalize or excuse Bush's campaign tactics of 1988. I think they were truly horrible. I, I'm a huge Dukakis fan. I think he was wholly wronged. Uh, and uh, that that goes on his record. Uh, I mean, and, and some people, well, the Willie Horton ad was an independent expenditure. It wasn't directly from the campaign. You know, he was talking about Willie Horton uh, before then. And you, you then do the wink wink. Someone who's like three degrees removed from the campaign does the more racist version of the argument to compliment what the candidate's been doing. Uh, Bush may, I mean, I don't want to be an apologist. I just don't know the answer to this. But I mean, it, it's it's plausible that Bush had some sort of plausible <laughs> deniability that he actually, he obviously he was talking about Willie Horton. I think it's a legitimate issue to talk about. But there's also a way, I think, to use it um, in an unseemly manner, which and, – and I think it's, it, it's definitely plausible that, that Lee Atwater and other people were like, look, we're doing this. The old man doesn't need to know. And th so I don't know that that – tarnishes his his legacy well he's, he's, he's still responsible for his campaign whether he literally knew about right. it or not uh but my, the point i want to make is i think there are some on the left that want to say he does, he shouldn't get a pass just because he can carpet carpentalize and then govern by in a bipartisan fashion later you know that's just an example of how disingenuous he is he doesn't that he doesn't credit for that uh but uh Contrast that. Contrast Bush with saying, you know what? There's campaigning and there's governing. I'm going to be a total bastard when I'm campaigning. Governing is a different story. I'm going to play it straight once I get there. Contrast that with what's going on with Wisconsin right now or what happened in North Carolina before. You know, okay, we lost the election, and who cares what the voters had to say? Let's grab all the power we can and undercut the people who won because this, this war never stops. And uh, I'm going to do that because this state is so polarized that we and, and we successfully gerrymandered the districts so handily that we don't think we're going to pay any kind of political price two years later for doing this. I mean, that is the opposite of how a George H.W. Bush functioned in practice when he had uh, when he was in the seat of power. Uh, so uh, as much as I would say, don't forget. 88, yeah. <clears throat> I think, don't forget the fact that he had a sense of honor when he was governing, too. No, I think that's a good point. And I would just, you know, say that 
people are complex and things are nuanced. And, you know, if, if you judge any of us by our worst day versus our best day, there's going to be a, a lot, a huge dichotomy there. And we could get into a thing where there are no heroes and there are nobody is worth remembering or honoring if, if we want to play that game and go down the list. And we could just, you know, be iconoclasts and destroy every president if we wanted to. We could do that. And do we want to focus on that? I would argue that, you know, while we shouldn't be, you know, Pollyanna or, or naive, that if there was ever a time when it's nice to, to maybe come together and celebrate, you know, something... Uh, this would be a good time to do it. Uh, let me pivot a bit to uh, the Democratic presidential primary 2020, which does speak to this whole notion of finding a good fighter. Uh, Democrats lost a fighter, Michael Avenatti, bowing out. He was sort of the biggest you know, explicit, uh, yeah. the more explicit argument that we need to go go low, hit them What's harder. Funny. What's funny is that the life cycle of Michael Avenatti was what we thought would happen to Trump. So you thought character's destiny, eventually it's going to catch up to you. You can't get away with the, the braggadocio and the playing this game. And it never really did for Trump. You know, but Michael Avenatti... If Trump faced a domestic abuse charge in the beginning of his candidacy... <laughs> It probably would be a different story. Some of that stuff, the sexual misconduct charges came out at, towards the end, uh, where he had already built this bond with his people, and they were, were they willing to discount almost anything. If it came, I'd, in, like, to, I'd like to believe you're right, Bill. <laughs> I hope you're right. I hope you're right. Um, but I don't know. Uh, a, a mere theory. Uh, but I, I don't think Avenatti's departure. You know, there, you know Chris Liz had a piece about this. Uh, what Eliza was saying, just because Avenatti's gone, doesn't mean that Democrats don't want someone in his mold as a nominee, and there's a good appetite for that. And you know, Eliza always gets a very hard time, you know, in, in social media. So a lot of people are like, "What are you talking about?" You know, the, the hot the hot thing is, is is Beto, who's not that kind of candidate at all. Uh, why are you assuming that Democrats want a guy like Avenatti? Uh, and I would say I, I think this is not fully adjudicated in the Democratic Party. I, I, there definitely is an appetite for someone Avenatti-like. I'm not going to predict that it's going to be someone like that, but yeah. there's still a lane for that. And well, um, you know where I'm at on this, Bill. I believe, as I've said many times, I don't think you can out tough Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. I don't think, and I I also don't think you could do the opposite. Like I don't think you could ignore him and be boring and. Um, and try to duck him and avoid the fight. And st I don't think you could stay above the fray. I think the way to beat him is to like out cool him and to talk the generational change argument. And I think that's why I'm much more bullish on Beto than you are. I think that think of a matchup like what if Obama could have run against Trump? What would he have done? How would he have? withstood the attacks like i think trump would destroy elizabeth warren which is which i know is where we're heading right right but i think there's a way to sort of say okay old man you're you're out of touch you're well they, I, I mean, that's, that's what obama Trump dealt with Trump. mccain he, they play the out of touch right. card very very well uh yeah. and mm -hmm. maybe in a 2008 you know two non-incumbents going at each other you know maybe obama would be able to do that to Trump, it's sort of hard to game out now because Trump is a manifestation of a post-Obama world where a, a backlash on the right was forming. Uh, so, but I, I think to your larger point, it's sort of finding that sweet spot where you're fighting just enough without taking the bait and getting off your game, which is tricky. And, and, and no one no one found that sweet spot in 2016. Uh, so here comes Elizabeth Warren. It's where we want to get to. There's, there's a piece in the Times today about how the whole her handling of the whole uh, Native American heritage DNA test has dogged her since that happened in October. Uh, and I do think that it, it has been a significant problem for her. But I think her problem had manifested before that point, you know, she, you know, Avenatti, you know, had a boom bust cycle within the the confines of 2018. He was not a name in 2017. 
in January 1st, 2018, Warren was top tier. It, the top tier was Bernie, Biden, Warren. They're the only three people in what little polling existed that they had were in double digits. And, and Warren was a name brand. She uh, had a pack, a draft Warren pack in 2016. She, there's children's books by Elizabeth Warren. There's an action figure by Elizabeth Warren. Uh, and she had the whole nevertheless she persisted moniker that Mitch McConnell unwittingly bestowed upon her. And an email list and a network of donors. You know, she's got a lot going for her in that respect. But she's the only candidate in 2018 who has dropped. You know, her polling level has declined over the course of 2018, and you can't say that about anybody else. Uh, and you could ascribe it all to the DNA test, but I think there's something deeper there, which is, one, the thing that she made her name with, which was dressing down Wall Street types from her perch in the Senate, that's not a thing right now. That's not the focus of people's ire on the left. It's about Trump and what he's do- doing to democracy in the world. Um, so her perceived strength in 2016 isn't necessarily her strength today. Uh, now, also in 2016, people were cheering her on when she tweeted against Trump that she'd have all these, you know, put downs uh, against him and people thought that's how you do it that's how you stick it to Trump Elizabeth Warren she's going to take the fight right to him uh, and then in 2017 2018 before the DNA test she was trying to deal with the whole po- Pocahontas thing she had a speech to Native Americans earlier and she was trying to just her focus on that never seemed quite as sharp as when she was fighting Trump on her turf on the economic yeah. turf, uh, and the DNA test seemed to, you know, be a, a, a cap on that weak strategy. And now, and so now, 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 not only do you see certain of Americans complaining about the um, legitimacy of the test, so that I think there's divide in that community. It would be unfair to say it was a, it's a one-sided argument. But you have people on the broader activist left saying this is not how you go against Trump. You're 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 taking the bait from a bully. She played it wrong, uh, and I don't think that means that she's doomed as a candidate, but she sort of needs to recalibrate, adapt, and find something different to do because the trajectory she's on right now is not good for her. Look, I agree with you. She has not played her cards well, but I, I agree with the people on the left who say the fundamental problem with Elizabeth Warren is that there's a fundamental problem. <laughs> you, you, um, there is a, fl- there is a, you know, you, you can't go to Babe Ruth. Donald Trump is the Babe Ruth of negative, nasty <laughs> attacks. And you might hit the batting cages and you might be a pretty good hitter, but you're not going to out slug Babe Ruth. You could take some karate classes, get pretty good, but you probably don't want to pick a fight with Bruce Lee. Donald Trump is the Bruce Lee of negative nastiness. You just, you're, I just don't think you can play, you, the easy thing to say would be you wrestle with a pig and you get muddy and the pig enjoys it. But that's basically it. I just don't think the model of like, let's find our tough person who can come on, tweet. You can send tweets against him. <laughs> What's going to be go back and watch those debates. Say what you will about Trump. Not doesn't think that deep, doesn't have any firm commitments to political philosophy or ideology, but super quick on his feet, put downs of Hillary Clinton. That's the kind of thing when you're thinking of of eventually getting a nominee who's going to stand on a debate stage, presumably with Donald Trump, not just tweeting, having a team of people help. What should we what snarky things should we tweet? Really hard to go up against against Trump. What kind of person? I think someone like a, a cinema or a Beto. I think someone new, fresh, and I think generational change. Now, you, now you had a piece he, of the Daily Beast. Donald Trump's a bridge to the past. <laughs> <laughs> this person's a bridge to the future. Now, you had a piece of the Daily Beast, which I cannot read. Yeah. <laughs> you need to become part of the beast inside. Right. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not behind the beast paywall. Yes. But for what I could glean from what the teaser, because you, you, you've you been pretty excited about Beto uh, up to this point, but it seemed to be suggesting you were kind of moving beyond Beto and moving towards Kirsten Cinema, who are not peas in a pod. 
No, but both would represent generational change. But the piece is about generational change. And but rather than being harping on Beto being the millionth person to once again, Democrats should pick him. I wanted to find, let's find another example of somebody who would be a stark contrast to Donald Trump. And I really think, now look, as you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of people who have experience, who are qualified, but that doesn't always work. There was once a guy named George H.W. Bush who was incredibly qualified and in fact had four years of overseeing the nation and the American public said, oh, you just won the Cold War? Oh, let's move on to someone, to an Arkansas governor who's young. I think that this is a kind of, it may not be a good thing for America, but Democrats have tend to succeed when they can pass the torch to a new generation. I think that's the move. But that's an interesting contrast you make there. You know, Bush, H.W. Bush got into a problem in 92 when his experience seemed ill-suited to the moment. So his experience was great for managing the Cold War. It was great for dealing with Saddam Hussein. It, it just perception-wise, it wasn't it didn't the right kind of experience for managing an economic recession. He, he seemed out of touch. He seemed to not know what to do, although I think the truth was that he believed that you shouldn't do anything. You should ride it out. This, this wasn't a financial crash recession like 2008. This was your run-of-the-mill recession, which was... It was already turning around. It was already turning around. <laughs> so. Uh, so it's not like he was like totally out to lunch to say, you know what, don't overreact here. This is a blip, and I'm. Yeah. It's, it sucks to get laid off. And but, if you go back and watch... Go back and watch or listen to that question where the uh, it's a town hall debate and he's asked, you know, how does the deficit impact you personally? Right. Go back and listen. Everybody holds that up as an example of Bush falling flat. He had a pretty good answer. Now, Bill Clinton had a great answer. Well, uh, I mean, his, his, Bush, Bush Bush's problem helpful. there was that he took the, the question was an awkwardly worded question made by someone, a, a town hall participant, who wasn't that economically literate, quite frankly, because she really wasn't talking about how does the deficit affect you. She somehow how does the economy affect you? And she just conflated deficit with the economy. So Bush starts making this answer about, you know, numbers on a ledger. And then she seems to try to nudge him to a different direction. And I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about you know, day-to-day life on the ground. And he and he wasn't quite getting it because the question was awfully worded. And Clinton sort of just looked past the wording of yeah. the question and got right down to the nitty-gritty of people's economic well, realities. Clinton hit it out of the ballpark with the emotional. If someone loses their job, there's a good chance I know them. Right. There's, you know, he hit it out of the ballpark. I still contend that George Bush answered that – forget about confu- conflating the economy with the deficit – that he actually had a pretty good answer because it's hard when you're, A, a really rich guy, and, B, you've been president for four years and vice president for eight years. If someone is asking you, how are you personally impacted by a recession – it's you. You are structurally disadvantaged. But, 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 but he should have anticipated that. He said. That. He said, it matters to me because I have grandchildren and I want them to inherit a strong country and to have a future. I think that's probably the best answer. Yeah, he but have given. but his his route to getting there was messy. And there's even a point where he sounds a little petulant. Like, are you trying to suggest because I have means that I don't I don't have a feelings about? It? I, of course I do. And it's kind of like, buddy, you know. Chill out. <laughs> Someone's telling you about their hard times. Don't make this. Don't make this about you. Even though it's, a, it's an ambush question because the question is about you. Uh, but yeah, Clinton, that very- question. There's. There's. That question is built for Bill Clinton. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. If the this is actually an important point. What if the question had been? No. I, I grant that there was a recession taking place at that moment. But what if the fundamental question? that the TV networks are playing the next day is name a time in your life when you've really sacrificed for your country. Now I think Bill Clinton is structurally disadvantaged sure, and but, George H.W. Bush. But, but that, w- that wasn't the issue of the day. Right. And so right. to get back to your original point, yep. um, is this a moment for a new generation type of candidate? My point in 92... 
that question was intrinsically tied to the question of the economy. The kind of experience Bush had didn't fit, didn't seem to fit what the country needed right then. So it wasn't just an age question. It was a substance question. Now, the Trump is old, but he's also seen as ill-experienced and ill-fitted to the job. Yeah. So it doesn't, I mean, you, you can still argue it's time for a fresh, fresh race. I'm not saying a young person can't beat him, but it's not quite as neat because you could also say, let's have a Joe Biden, let's have an Elizabeth Warren, let's have a Bernie. I mean, they're very different characters, all of them. Uh, but to say, you know what, we need to have a steady hand on the tiller now after sure. four years of chaos by someone who had no business being there. And that's well, also... You can make that of- argument, and you could make the electoral argument, too, that says... And Joe Biden can win Pennsylvania. Right, right. And Ohio. And I get that. I think what I'm saying is if I'm betting, and look, Democrats, number one, can take my advice with a grain of salt, and I could be wrong. I'm just saying if you're gaming this out and playing the percentages, what kind of person would I, if I'm a Democrat, gamble on having a chance to beat Trump? How many mo- we've had now since George H.W. Bush, since 1992, which he was the great, you know, the the last of the greatest generation. And but since then, we have had baby boomers. And, you know, everybody you're talking about, Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, they're in their 70s. I it, it feels to me like there is got to be an um, a bubbling out there for change, oh, and, and 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 the and, and the most obvious change is the generational change. There is, look, I think that you know Warren's declined. Warren's yeah. no longer a top tier candidate right now. I mean, d- defining it as being in double digits. I mean, you could argue she's top tier if I defined it more broadly. Um, but right now, the only person who people can be consistently double digits are Bernie and Biden, and that's it. Uh, and. That doesn't necessarily mean they will be one of those two, because obviously plenty of people come up from uh, the, the the bottom tier. And you know, Beto, you know, the most recent poll I saw, Beto was at seven, which put, put him in third place. <laughs> and of course, he was in Nowheresville uh, before then. There's definitely some Beto movement uh, out there. Um, but Bernie and Biden, I think, take up a lot of oxygen. They will also spark a backlash by people saying what you're saying. We need to have a fresh face here. We cannot have this be yeah. uh, two old white guys running against each other. And I, but, I, I want to real quick make a point, too, because I don't want us to be accused of of hypocrisy or something. I, I think we we both agree, and I'll just speak for myself. I thought Nancy Pelosi was the smart move for Democrats in the House of Representatives yes. as Speaker. Because I think that it is a fundamentally different role. It's not a front-facing being, job. Right. You know, that's who's good in the bowels of government. That's Nancy Pelosi. That's yeah. not who's going to be good on TV, who's going to rally the country and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, sure, there's going to be a – there's certainly – there's more than just room. There's going to be a huge appetite for someone to say, I'm the bolt of fresh energy and generational change in this, in this campaign – but it's certainly not just Beto. I mean, I mean, Cinema. As much as you like her, she's not. Doesn't seem to be running. Uh, I just throw that out there. I just throw that out there as a outside the box type of thinking. I think that you know that it's not going. I in the olden days, it would have been who look. Let's look at some governors or senators. And now I think we have entered into an era where experience is a net negative. Donald Trump is a classic well, example. I, I, I don't think you can definitively make that judgment because there, there will be people making experience arguments because Trump has been so an inexperienced president has done such a bad job. People will make experience arguments too. Uh, that's not going to be knocked out of the box. But right now, I agree. I agree. You, there's different ways to contrast. And if you're going to run against Trump... There are different potential ways to contrast. I think it's hard, even though Donald Trump had no experience, he is now the president, and he will have been the president for four years when the election's he, held. He's, he's learned so much. He's, he's, grown, he's grown the position. 
But it's kind of hard to make the experience argument against a sitting president, I, I, even I, if it's Donald I, Trump. I think in this case you will, you will be able to. But um, I think you could make an argument uh, where a bridge to the future, and then that's your main – sort of the main message is a generational change, but then it's also – more serious, less chaos. I think you know, there's sub message. But even in that lane, you're going to have you're probably going to have Beto, Gillibrand, Kamala, <laughs> Cory Booker, um, uh, politicians. You you may even also you may have Stacey Abrams. You may have Andrew Gillum. We're going to try to copy Beto and say I I lost a close race in the South. I have the juice to uh, go national. See, I actually think, and I I don't think either of them are going to run. But I think they would. I would probably go with. Stacey Abrams or Gillum before Kamala or Corey. You might even have, because I think they're politicians now. They're you might politicians. Even have, you might have uh, the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, Pete uh, Buttigieg. I'm pronouncing his last name wrong. I think he's just barely over the age qualification. Uh, uh, but he's a veteran. He's a millennial. He's he's openly gay. He's from a red state. Uh, he may throw his hat in the ring. I mean, I've heard a lot of talk about it lately, but it was mused about earlier. Uh, so I, there's going to be people yeah. competing for that slot, that young, fresh face slot. Yeah. Uh, and if you're going to overtake Bernie or Biden, you can't. That vote can't be divided very much. Yeah, you're gonna have to now. Now maybe Beto's got the hot hand right now. Um, and there's also the celebrity possibility. I suppose we should mention uh, that there maybe is an Oprah lane or something. Maybe, but right? who knows? You know, knows? Uh, I think people are going to be announcing after the new year. You already had a couple people announce already. You had Richard, Richard Ojeda announced last month, although that hasn't really gotten off the ground quickly. Uh, John Delaney's been in Iowa all year. Um, if, I'm, if I'm forgetting one other one who, who jumped in, uh, another uh, odd name, but forgive me. I don't think you'll be haunted by that. Um, but the bigger names are going to be coming in in January. There is a huge rush for donors, for for strategic advisors, for on-the-ground staff in early states. If you wait, you are losing out on people that you need. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a lot of room for latecomers in this race. Uh, so I think the field's going to get set and gelled pretty quickly. Uh, and people who don't have their ducks lined up are either going to yeah. get in and peter out fast or they're not going to get in at all. Or, they, or if they do come in late, they're going to learn that they, they work too late. Uh, and there's nobody that could freeze out the field and keep there's nobody who could flirt there's, there's no there's no huge person i mean even a biden or a bernie if they decide to be a little coy uh some people might wait for them but not everybody right. um uh and <laughs> and so now even with a beto uh if look maybe he becomes the young person candidate but right, and forgive me if we're going over old ground from before, I, I say this is based on so much hype, so much theory. Uh, he, I mean, you're already starting to see people on the Bernie Krat left start to poke holes at him in ways that they weren't doing when it was, okay, this guy versus Ted Cruz in Texas, sure, whatever, whoever <laughs> can beat Ted Cruz, I'm fine with that. Wait a second, now I have other choices for a populist left candidate. I don't need a guy who was for TPP. Uh, uh, I don't need a guy uh, who uh, isn't championing all the issues that I want to see championed. Um, he, he, I, I don't need someone who's a, a pretty celebrity face that's going to sand off the harder edge uh, agenda that I want to see. Um, so he is going to have to run through a wholly different kind of gauntlet. He didn't have a primary <laughs> to suffer through uh, in Texas of any, yeah. of any kind of significance. Um, no, I mean, look, it, he may – you never know until adversity hits what's going to happen. So just, Marco, just, Look at Marco Rubio, right, how, right. how that kind of right. went. No, maybe he'll be back, but – didn't go well in 16. So just like Warren has to adapt, I mean, Warren maybe has a bit of a incentive to adapt quickly because she sees what has transpired in the past year hasn't been good for her. I don't know if Beto has gotten the message that this is a different kind of race you're going to be running, both primary and general. You can't just get in your van and air drum in the car and stream you 24-7. I think that's going to do the trick. This is a totally different landscape you're going to be running in. And you're going to be scrutinized in a way that you were not scrutinized yeah. over the past year. Well, it's funny how, how for some reason, Democrats... You know, Republicans have tried to go with youth candidates and in some cases in a way 
it's like affirmative action R- rather than letting them um, fight. We, we have Republicans have tried to kind of foist them. So whether it's like Dan Quayle or Sarah Palin or even someone like a Marco Rubio, Republicans who've gotten behind young candidates have seen those young candidates kind of wither in the face of adversity. Democrats look at Obama. Now, I know Obama got much better throughout those, all those debates uh, in 2007 and eight with Hillary Clinton, but he rose to the occasion. And I don't know if it's just he's an exceptional politician, a quick learner, or if he just had more experience than, say, a mayor of Wasilla, Alaska. I don't know. But Beto, like them all, would have to rise to the occasion. And it's like probably going from playing for the Frederick Keys to playing for the New York Yankees. Well, I, I, th- I, mean, I mean, I talk in my negative Beto piece that we talked about a, few, a couple shows ago. I mean, there's a difference between a Barack Obama and a John Edwards, you know, both who came in who were young with a lot of hype. Uh, Obama rose to the occasion and Edwards didn't. Uh, now, part of that is the candidate. I think Obama was a good learner. You look at some of his early appearances in the 2008 campaign and, you know, 2007, they weren't that great. He got better as he went along. And when he took a punch, he came back very, uh, not just cleverly, but creatively. Uh, and when people were looking for someone who was going to, who can stand up to, Carl Rove type attacks, he made people feel like, you know, this guy's actually figured it out. Uh, and uh, now you're going to deal with Trump type attacks. It's a whole different yeah. you know, kind, of, kind of story. There's also uh, magic and charisma and luck and stuff like that. Well, but it's you know, hard to quantify. But also beyond that, I mean, Obama had a central issue, which was I saw the Iraq war was a disaster early before any of y'all. Bush Biden, Hillary, Edwards, all you guys, you bet wrong, I bet right, and not just that with some knee-jerk anti-war activists who always is against war, I had a fully fleshed out critique, and I'm going to flesh out even more over the campaign trail. Right. What does Beto have that is equivalently central to his candidacy that says, I'm not, it's not just that I, I talk nice on the stump, <clears throat> I'm about something that distinguishes me, right. not from Republicans, but from other Democrats. He doesn't have it, but like Obama, he's a fresh face. Obama had been in the Senate for 15 minutes before he started running for, for president, and he could run on hope and change. He yeah, could but- run by checking off the box of I'm a progressive, the left likes me, and I'm also non-threatening, just like Obama, and I'm also hopeful and optimistic. I don't think Bernie or Elizabeth Warren or Kamala Harris can check off the optimistic, smiling, you know, well, they're, they're running running whole, again in America. Well, I don't but. know exactly how you know, Bernie and Warren are going to run. I, mean, I, I think Warren is trying. I mean, you, you look at the video she did for the DNA test which is being kind of mocked now as being overly slick. Uh, but I, I – and the whole DNA controversy aside, you can see in that video how much work Warren has done to tweak her persona, where she's not uh, the hectoring professor uh, – and I don't think it's artifice. I think she comes across pretty naturally – talking on the porch with her brothers in Oklahoma. I don't think it seems staged. I, I think she worked on it. I think she practiced it. Um, but I, it is a fact that she wasn't born in a Harvard Ivory Tower. She was born in Oklahoma. It was always part of her persona that she wasn't a liberal Democrat by birth. Uh, and I think she is trying to get back to that to say, you know yeah. what, the, the character of me that you've been hearing, not just from Republicans, maybe from other Democrats in the media, that's not my full story. Here's my, the complete Elizabeth Warren, whereas Bernie is Bernie. Bernie's always going to be Bernie. Uh, that That's his calling card. That's what makes him authentic to people. Uh, he's never going to be a happy, smiley guy. I think Warren's trying to strike a balance. Now, she gave that foreign policy speech, which was heavy on economic populism. I'm going to have a foreign policy that's rooted in economic populism that still had that fire. Um, So I don't know if she's totally melded these two things, but I do think she has put thought into how does one run for president as opposed to how does one interrogate somebody in a Senate committee. I just think it's super hard to run as a sitting U.S. senator who's been there for more than 
a couple years now and um and and run as a folksy rail splitter you know <laughs> I, I just don't know if it's possible and the fact that she's in massachusetts i think it's all about perception you know she's not in if she was living in oklahoma and not in the senate she would probably be better positioned I think. Well, I, I I think she probably made a mistake. I, I think she got too close to other uh, left organizations, and she became kind of like adopted by them. You know, there was almost like a, like a mind meld, and she lost that sense of Oklahoma and being more of a regular American, not bound by party ideological lines, and more of a classic populist progressive democrat uh and now she's trying to get it back yeah. uh, for this campaign which it would have been easier if she if she stuck to that persona all the way through uh and and maybe she can't get it back but i do think there's an awareness with her and her team that just being you know a a bernie 2.0 and that's it that's probably not going to cut it here yeah uh super interesting and i do think that Again, Avenatti, I know, has an asterisk, but if you don't count Avenatti, that's somebody whose stock has definitely fallen yes. as we yes. as we head into the new year. That it's is not true. Too, it's that not is. too early for us to start doing our our 2018 in retrospective episode. Oh, I'm uh, I mentioned this because I'm already working on already working on a piece there. <laughs> well, if we solve the world's problems, I think we're agreed that that George H.W. Bush, Bush deserves at least a week in the sun and that um, Beto O'Rourke is is going to be the next nominee. <laughs> I mean, that's what I heard you say. At least. Uh, maybe not quite. We're not, we're not quite on the same page there, but uh, we'll, 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 I, I, don't, I don't count him out. Uh, I think he's going to have to step up his game immeasurably if he was actually going to go all the way. Well, that is there is no doubt about that. <laughs> They're throwing to. I feel like I'm using a lot of baseball metaphors today, but they're going to be throwing some high heat. And are you sad? Is it, I know you're not. Are you? Are you still doing the NFL boycott? Yes. Don't call it a boycott. I, I feel the same way about the NFL that I feel about carbs, which is I don't take a hard line. You know, I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm never going to eat another slice of pizza, but by and large, I try to avoid them, and I'm happier and I'm better off for it. And the NFL, let me give you the latest example, Bill. So as, as I told some of my friends, I was like, you know, the Redskins are two or three wins away from me coming out of retirement and becoming a Fairweather fan and rooting for them. And then they've got that big Monday night game in Philadelphia. And I just, I woke up the next morning. I didn't watch a minute of it, thankfully. I woke up the next morning, just go online. I'm like, yep, those are the red. That's the Redskins again. I'm glad I didn't invest any emotional bandwidth into this team. <laughs> Dan Snyder. Yes. Uh, so are you in a, a broader sports withdrawal in these cold winter months and therefore that hunger for baseball is on your mind well i don't think so but based on today based on the references man, you know i think you don't have to be a freudian to think that maybe there's some deep-seated longing for the boys of summer and and maybe it's a george bush thing too you know as his the the base the famous picture of him, I think it's him and Babe Ruth. You no, know, I, 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 I never saw that photo before. I think Michael Beschloss tweeted that photo yeah. out. I, I I did not know they had met. That's and, pretty cool. Yeah. All right, sir. Uh, anything to plug this week? Well, I we haven't mentioned that you can follow us on Twitter at DMZ Show. You should be following this show on Twitter, and we tweet occasionally. Like, if Bill, let's just I'm just throwing this out there. If Bill can't tape one week, whoa. If Bill can't tape one week, we'll often, you know, alert you to that. And otherwise, we'll just let you know. Uh, sometimes it's a tweet. Sometimes it's a retweet of, of the blogging head's suits. But we will let you know when an episode pops. So definitely check that out. Also, you can listen to this. If you don't like if you don't like looking at us and watching the dialogue, and why wouldn't you? We look great. But <laughs> if you didn't, you could listen to this on iTunes. 
and just search for Blogging Heads, and you'll find us. Uh, it's, it's not quite up yet. I think it should be up for the end of the week. Uh, I interviewed uh, author Patricia O'Toole of a fantastic Woodrow Wilson biography, The Moralist Woodrow Wilson and the World He Made. Um, I, if you have any interest in that, period of history uh you will enjoy it uh that's at the that's the new books and politics podcast over the new books network newbrooksnetwork.com i love it and, and uh, always uh, check out matt lewis and the news on itunes as well lots of good stuff coming up there and uh bill maybe we should think about doing a look back at the year that was 2018 we'll, we'll, have, we'll, we'll have to get there soon uh yes very soon uh, but I, I'm going to wish you uh, a happy Hanukkah, even though it's not your uh, uh, holiday of choice. Uh, Thank you, sir. But, right uh, back at you. Uh, we did have some uh, uh, some uh, Hanukkah chocolates yesterday. I need to, uh, we, we had some latkes that were not homemade, and quite frankly, weren't that great. Yeah. Uh, I would like to make some homemade latkes and some homemade donuts before the the eight nights is up. Uh, but, uh, but it'll be Christmas before you know it, and uh, we'll, right. we'll hopefully we can get our retrospective in before then. Well, and I'm sensing some trends here. Baseball's on my mind and chocolate's on yours. So <laughs> it is the season. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. See you, everybody. Take care.